accept what you cannot change and then change what you cannot accept. That's the order. That's the recipe for resilience. We live in a time of, of great change. We're going to a time of great transformation. Eh? We got a reading crisis in the Netherlands. We got a climate crisis in the Netherlands. Yeah, I've got a belly crisis. Yeah. <laughs> but think about this one, the corona crisis, for example. The last two years, was this a coronavirus? Was this the corona, the big corona crisis for you? Or the big corona vacation, as my kids like to call it? Yeah? It's the same event, but change the way you think about the events in your life and change your reality. Think upside down. My name is Nick van der Adel, and today I will going to tell you about how to build a resilient mindset. I'm going to tell you that we can overcome much more than we think, and I'm going to give you some lessons on how to become future proof. I grew up in the eastern parts of the Netherlands, got a very happy childhood, uh, worked in the hospitality industry my whole life. And when I was 26, 27, um, I read our labor agreement, and then I thought, okay, that's not going to happen. Yeah, so I became a consultant. And the whole day I got hired at a very famous firm in Rotterdam, and the whole day people were shouting to me that I had talent. So much that I started to believe myself that I had talent. I got a very big tie, a very big suit, a big BMW, an even bigger salary, an even bigger ego as well. A house in Amsterdam with a wooden floor and a parking permit. Yeah, that was the happiest day of my life, or, or it wasn't, because I was lying on the couch for at least six to seven months with Coca-Cola and some French fries, because I completely lost the meaning of my life as well, a burnout, as we'd like to call it at this stage. I was living in a very big city, Amsterdam, and I'm just a small guy from a small village. I wanted to have a girlfriend for so many years, but why wasn't nobody loving me? Because I wasn't loving myself at that stage anymore. And what do youngsters do from my age that are 27, 28, that lost the meaning in their life? They buy a motorcycle yeah, to feel the adventure again. And that results in a date. And you and I, if we have one thing in common today, at least one thing in common, we all have a date or maybe dates in our life that everything, but really everything changed. Maybe for you it was somebody that something happened to your kids, you got fired, your, your relationship broke up. We all have a date in our lives. And my date is the 16th of July, 2010. And as I wake up, it's uh, dark around me, it's cold, it's wet. I'm lying on my back and, and I realize it's the heart of the summer. It didn't even rain yet. And later on in life, I learned that it's a big portion of my own blood. I'm trying to stand up, but my body isn't responding anymore. I want to shout for help, but it's just one little voice in my head that says, Nick, you completely, but completely ruined it now. Now all your dreams are, are over. Why? After a 16-hour workday with some alcoholic beverages on the way, I'm standing at 3 a.m. in the night in front of my motorcycle. My friends would pick me up. They couldn't after all the cab. We weren't driving anymore. And I, I realized thinking those 10 minutes, those 10 minutes back to my place. I've driven them over a thousand times. And I step on that motorcycle. And in the first corner where I should have taken a right turn, I go straight ahead. And in a rural country, I hit a fence, fly about 10 meters into the air, and I land on the side of the pave walk there by myself. And nobody even knew that I stepped on that motorcycle. And just that one little voice, Nick, you completely, completely ruined it now. And I'm starting to count the stars, making star signs, everything, not to fall asleep, but I lose that battle. So between 3 a.m. and 6 o'clock in the morning, I fall asleep, wake up, fall asleep, wake up, and I'm there by myself every time in that bad dream. And it's 6 o'clock in the morning, and I realize that I really should do, start doing something. If not, it's the end of the story. I grab my cell phone with my right hand out of my left pocket, which is miraculously still working, and I dial 112, and a very friendly woman picks up the phone. And she says, who are you? And I have absolutely no clue. And now, 12 years later, I still don't have a clue, but different story. Yeah. And a few moments later, a car with blue flashing lights stops in front of my feet, and a woman and a man are stepping out, and her are talking in her microphone. We found him, and that's the end of the battle um, all by myself. They shut down the highway, drive me into the emergency room in Amsterdam, and when I wake up, my brothers and my sisters are standing in front of my 
bed, and a big man steps into the room with a white coat. And he says, Nick, you've got a spinal cord injury, and you're paralyzed from chest down for the rest of your life. Now, this is the hard part of today. Yeah, I see some people here looking at me, what kind of a presentation is this? But there's a very happy young man sitting here in front of you. And this is not going to be a 100% Mr. Positivity story that I'm going to tell you to get a spinal cord injury to become happy again. Yeah? You know better than that. But there's a very happy man here. The 16th of July didn't have a meaning. I gave it a meaning. And maybe you did the same with the dates in your life. The dates in our life don't have a meaning. You can give it a meaning. And maybe that's the recipe by becoming resilient in life. Learn from our failures. Learn from our setbacks. So I was trying to find a life again that made me happy um, again. Because it wasn't a big suit. It wasn't a big tie. It wasn't a big salary. It wasn't a big car. But what does make me happy in life then? What did help that I went to rehab in Utrecht, one of the rehab centers in the Netherlands for people with a spinal cord injury. And after approximately three months, I completely, 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 completely uh, fell in love with my occupational therapist. And she fell in love with me as well, by the way. That's kind of good for the story, yeah? <laughs> and that's illegal, by the way, but it's a very nice thing as well, yeah? And then in the, in the worst moment of my life, I met the love of my life as well. The only thing we need in life is a little bit of love. The only thing we need in life is a little bit of love. The rest is poo, BS. Yeah? And Kim and I, we were so happy. We moved in together, and we got three beautiful, but then beautiful, beautiful daughters, Pepefine, the twin, and Anna, the youngest one. Yeah? Anna, she's not missing a chromosome. She just looks like that all the time. Yeah? Yeah? She looks a lot like her dad, though. Ooh. But it makes here a very happy, and, and I, I'm not going to romantize that spine injury, uh, because I do suffer as well. Um, but every day, by making little steps, I become better and better and better in dealing with everything that I have to deal with. Yeah? Okay. So, resilience. Let's talk about the subject a little bit. We in the Netherlands, we have the only, the only country in the world that uses a feather, a feather force, to describe resilience. So we put stress on a feather, yeah, and it bounces back to its old form. Yeah, the Italians, I just found it out last week, they use the word elastico. Yeah, only Italian people can say that, eh? Elastico, for becoming resilient in life. To bounce back, to bounce back when something happens in your life. And maybe bounce a little bit further. And then we talk about post-traumatic growth. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. What can we learn? So people with a severe trauma in their life, they're not more resilient than people that don't have anything in their life. Resilience is built in the middle. Resilience is built when you wake up, you had a bad night, and it's raining on your way to work. You step in your bicycle, and of course your colleague is sick. Yeah, the nice one, the stupid still has to work. Yeah? And you come in your work, and, and, and your computer is not working. Yeah? You got 50 new emails a day like this. Yeah? Resilient is built to learn from the small setbacks in your life. Now again, back to the order I was describing you about earlier on. Accept what you cannot change. So how do we, how do we accept? We accept by accepting that life is painfully happy. And we live in a time that we want to accept the happy part of our lives, but don't want to accept the painful part anymore. That's why we call it a crisis. A crisis is that we don't want to be that. We're fighting, that we're struggling the time to get back to our old form and what I invite you what I want to invite you today is to step to embrace the new form how do you do that let me do a little experiment with you today little experiment so what if there's a what if there is a red button in your life big big red button and if you smash the red button all the setbacks all the bumps in your life disappear yeah so that you're girlfriend or your friend broke up with you, that you got fired from your job, that something happened in your health or your health of your partner or your kids, everything disappears. However, if you smash the red button, all the lessons and all the new events because of that setback in your life disappear as well. So, that you get fired, that now you have the job of your life, that you once you're your girlfriend or friend broke up with you, you got the partner of your life, that you 
had a, a, an injury or whatsoever that you can enjoy the little moments in your life even better right now. So, honest question, if I give you the red button, how many setbacks, how many bumps, how many changes in your life would you actually erase, disappear? And then somebody in the audience early on asked me, like, Nick, that's a great story, but if I give you a red button, would you erase the spinal cord injury? And my honest answer is sometimes I would and sometimes I wouldn't because it gave me a lot as well. And by looking at our setbacks in our lives like that, it gives us space. It gives us perspective. And in perspective, we can create resilience. Yeah? Because for all the companies that I can do this keynote, for all the companies that I talk, and I ask somebody, how are you doing at the moment? They give me one answer at the moment, and it's uh, uh, busy. Yeah? Or busy, busy, busy. If you say it three times, then you're more busy than the other person. Yeah? But well, we're busy. My life is a red race. Life is going on. And... Uh, there's one thing, resilience is built when you stop. Resilience is built when you take some time off. Accept what you cannot change. And then change what you cannot accept. Yeah? So this is the resilience model from New Mason's University. And it's got five factors, which we use in my company as well. It's got your meaning in life, positive emotions, social support, who you're surrounding yourself with, coping mechanisms, how do you deal with change, and your physical well-being how are you taking care of yourself at the moment? Yeah? How are you eating? How are you sleeping? Um, and I'm not going to do all of them with you, but I'm going to do one, your social support. You are the average person of the, the five person that you surround yourself the most with. So who are you at that stage? I was spent eight months in rehab, in the rehabilitation center, and after those eight months, I said goodbye to three of my good <coughs> friends. Why? I had a lot of friends. I studied hospitality management that I could drink a lot of beers with. That had barely started somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but I was actually four or five days in a week, I was in the bar in my rehab center. And I wanted to have relationships that got deepened, that were more fulfilling. But I didn't have time for that. Why? Because I was spending all my time with people that were very, that gave me a lot of energy, but didn't give me a lot of value as well. So this is an exercise to look to plot your environment to see who you're surrounding yourself with. You got 24 hours of energy in your life. Who are you spending your time with? And if you are the person that still meets up with a friend or a, 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 or a colleague, and every time you, you're getting out of the meeting and your energy is lower than it was before, this is a good exercise. So you got people that don't give you value and don't give you energy, we call them D players. You can dump them when you are on a lot of stress when you are in a bad period of your time. There's a people you drink a cup of coffee and say, ah, oh, nice weather today, yeah? Yeah, tomorrow it's gonna rain again, yeah? <laughs> Those times, they can suck the, 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 the air out of the room in three seconds. Those people, yeah? D players, dump them when you are in a lot of stress, when you're not doing so well. We got C players, they're very, very smart, they just don't give you energy, yeah? We got B players, of in your life, they give you a lot of energy, yeah? <laughs> I see them three, four times. You don't have to dump them all the time. I see them three, four times a year. Uh, I don't know what I did the next day, but that's a totally different story. And then, of course, um, my advice for you, surround yourself with as many A players in your life as you can imagine. People that give you energy and give you a lot of value. To be honest, this is not my best day today. I've got three sick daughters for the last two or three days. Uh, I didn't sleep that well, so when I drove here, I called one of my best friends, Benjamin, and he always makes me laugh within three seconds. And he teaches me something wise in the conversation. So Benjamin is an A player. Okay. Now, the last lesson that I'm going to share with you is the lesson of being grateful. Gratefulness is one of the best, most powerful emotions we human being, human being can feel in our life. And if you can become grateful for even the scars, in your life, if you can say thank you for the bad times in your life, it might be some ammunition for the times that it's not going to be so good in your life as well. So every night when we go to sleep, I read a story to my young daughters. I really like reading stories. I don't know if they like it, but I like reading the stories for them. Eh? Yeah, And we play a little resilience game. And I say somewhere in this room there is a secret golden key. 
And with that golden key, you open up a door here in front of your head, you open the door, and every, every day you can put one happy memory inside of your head. Most of the time it's, it's ice cream or candy. Yeah? Yeah. And you close the door again, and you're going to hit that key somewhere in this room where you only know where it is. And that's how you create a playground of happy memories in your head that you can use in times where you're not doing so well. And maybe that's the way that you can learn to accept what you're going to change and then change what you cannot accept. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>